1996, Chuck Palahniuk published his groundbreaking novel Fight Club, about a group of men suffering alienation from manhood and struggling with their identities in a consumerist world. Of course, David Fincher came along a few years later, and the film version released in 1999. For the most part, the film was thematically faithful to the book, critiquing outdated ideas of masculinity and capitalism. But it just looked too damn cool to have a point for some people. So we got an entire generational subculture deciding the film was actually about how beating the shit out of one another is man's natural state of being. So you know, tomato, tomato. You get the idea. Polonek drew from a number of Marxist scholars like Max Weber and Emil Durkheim, as well as Marx himself, to draw conclusions about how modern humanity can be represented by consumer products like juicers, IKEA bookshelves, collectible dish sets, or a crew stain-resistant sectionals. If the post-World War II era taught us anything, it's that every family should want the modern conveniences of suburbia. And lint is caught in the filter, not on clothes. The problem comes when the pursuit of those modern conveniences replaces your potential as a human being. You stop experimenting with art or culture or even human connection and focus solely on the collection of things that represent your humanity. And what do we always say about representation? That's right, artifacts represent the thing, they are not the thing. And if we think of masculinity and femininity as two ways society gives us of being humans, then femininity is off limits for men because, let's face it, even in 2023 and especially in 1999, there are massive social consequences when men show even a hint of femininity. Then in a binary system, emasculation can be nothing short of dehumanization. So the protagonist of Fight Club was depressed and disconnected from society to the point where he, spoiler alert from 1990 frickety nine, disassociates his own hypermasculine etiquette flouting alter ego, Tyler Durden, who proceeds to lead him on a surreal journey into masculine reclamation, economic terrorism, and punching other dudes in the face. It's a pretty smart movie that suffers from David Fincher being such an expert filmmaker that film school bros got so mired in the cinematography, editing, and shot selection that they often miss the narrative point of the movie. All of which would be fine, but it's like reading The Great Gatsby and only focusing on the quality of paper stock, or the choice of font the publisher chose, you know? Oh, and if you've never seen it before, that thing I said about Tyler Durden just being a figment of the narrator's imagination, yeah, forget about that part, that was a lie. Anyway, 9-11 happened and we just kind of forgot about cinema that critiqued capital excess. And learned to love the bomb again. We'll put a boot in your ass, it's the American way. But the ensuing 24 years saw the election of the first black president, Donald Trump as a serious political figure, the rise of American fascism and Western chauvinism aided by social media, and undergirding it was an explosion in fourth wave feminism as evidenced by the Time's Up and Me Too movements. In other words, the latter half of the 20th century only more so. The point is, as the battle of the sexes lurched into the 21st century, the battle became more complicated and, if possible, more extreme. That's where Brandon Cronenberg, son of legendary Canadian body horror expert David Cronenberg, comes in with 2023's Infinity Pool, a film that similarly explores the intersection between wealth and identity, especially masculine identity, through its two leads, Alexander Skarsgård and Mia Goth. I will be resorting to spoilers here, so be forewarned. Infinity Pool tells the story of James Foster, a one-hit wonder novelist who is vacationing with his beautiful sugar mommy wife Em at a resort in Litolka, a nebulous fictional country where tourism is welcome, but the tourists are confined to a single compound, lest they be exposed to the poor, more oppressed elements of the country. James's writer's block and his dependence on his wife's money are a source of tension between them, and we get the sense that James feels like a failure, both as a novelist and as a man. At a violent demonstration by the locals, James meets Gabby, played by Mia Goth, who drops some casual racism before paying him a compliment. Your tokens are a melodramatic people. You're James Foster. I loved your book. She's such a huge fan that she invites James and M to have dinner with her and her husband, Alban. Gabby tells James she's an actress who specializes in failing naturally. In other words, she convinces people that she's helpless in order to manipulate them into buying products. Please. You wanna, you wanna see? Yeah, I want to see. I want to see. <laughs> it's impossible. No one can cut right with a knife. No one. No one. No one. 
And yes, if you're a sharp-eyed viewer, that does add some context for later. Talk turns to James's next book, and he has to admit that he has writer's block, and that the trip is supposed to knock him out of his rut. I'm working on it. Hmm. Writer's block? Well, I'm starting to think it might be the lack of talent. And while Gabby and Alban are trying to encourage him out of his negative self-talk, M practically buries him by casually calling herself a charitable organization for supporting him this long. You married well, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good for an artist to have a patron, isn't it? Yes. Oh, sure. I'm in yeah. danger of becoming a charitable organization <laughs> at this point. And yes, in case you hadn't already noticed, Cronenberg is laying the theme on thick with James's emasculating wife and his almost primal stalking of Gabby in the nightclub directly after. Much like the narrator in Fight Club, James is too docile and concerned with propriety to act on any of his urges. It's not until the next day, when the two couples travel outside of the compound to the beach, that Gabby takes matters into her own hands. The dynamics of this are not really dealt with in the text of the film, but James is sexually assaulted here, and his reaction is multifaceted. James was clearly shown wanting Gabby, but he is so taken by surprise at her actions that he scarcely has time to object. It's a complex scene, made all the more confounding by goth stoicism while doing it, and James's mixture of confusion, guilt, and shame after the fact. And while it raises some much-deserved eyebrows about consensual sex, it feeds a necessary narrative component. James certainly wasn't going to approach Gabby. He needed her to make the first move. With everyone else too drunk to drive, a sheepish James agrees to drive them back to the compound. That's when the Bower's headlights stop working, and instead of simply pulling over, James keeps driving and hits one of the local farmers. An adult version of the I know what you did last summer argument ensues, with James wanting to get help and Gabby telling him that the locals are brutal. Gabby bullies them into leaving the body and pretending that nothing ever happened. The ruse doesn't last long as the four are arrested the next day, with the investigator Detective Thresh telling James that M ratted him out as the driver. Your wife has confirmed this account. Oh, yeah. M, M did? Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, since the farmer died, Leetokun Custom states that the farmer's eldest male child will execute James as a matter of honor and justice. And this is where the film's magical realism kicks in, as Thresh tells James about the revised process of doubles act for international visitors and diplomats. Instead of being executed, James can pay a hefty fee to be cloned, and he can even witness his clone being executed in his stead if he wants. Everything about Thresh's explanation makes it seem so routine as to just be a grift for the local officials to strong arm more money out of the wealthy tourists. For a man who is as steeped in self-loathing as James is, this sounds like a pretty sweet deal. The actual cloning process is, of course, a Cronenbergian body horror nightmare. And if you're into that kind of thing, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Nor will you be disappointed in the unflinching violence the young farm boy visits on James's clone, complete with some Christ-like rib stabbing to really drive home the point. No pun intended. It's at this point where you really have to understand the psychology of self-loathing to get where the movie is going with all this. Yes, you can still enjoy it in a hey ride through Rob Zombie Town sort of way, and you can still appreciate the Marxist rich people are free to commit crimes aspect, but you won't have a connection to James's actions until you get that his character arc is driven by hatred of himself. Like the narrator of Fight Club, James starts from a place where his masculinity has been ripped away from him by the modern world, and replaced with… nothing. He only has the pursuit of it left. That's what makes both protagonists so hollow, and what drives their search for humanity anywhere they can find it. And while Fight Club's narrator seeks revenge on the corporations that lulled him into a consumerist lifestyle, James's journey is more complex. In Fight Club, there's no single person that creates the problem for the narrator. No embodiment of the system. It's his boss, sure. It's Ikea. It's the support group. It's doctors prescribing estrogen pills. But it's everyone. In Infinity Pool, Cronenberg uses M as a sort of catch-all for James's problems. And in the film's commentary track, he tries to explain that James is a man-baby. But the text of the film certainly gives us the feeling that M had a hand in making him that way. Oh, I'm in yeah. danger of becoming a charitable organization at this point. <laughs> it's hard to walk away from this film without getting the sense that James's problems are all caused by women. Emma is so shaken by the ordeal that she immediately packs her bags upon arriving back at the hotel, while James walks around in a sort of shell-shocked euphoria, having been handed the ashes of his own clone. James stashes his own passport, pretending it's hidden, 
and tells M to leave without him. This prompts her to trump the inhumanity hammer on him, telling him how disgusting he is for being able to watch himself get gutted in that way. It's really so disgusting. You could just sit there. This insult on James' humanity ignores the fact that he was the one who wanted to report the accident in the first place. What's wrong with you? Contrast that with Gabby's conversation with him at the bar. She explains that she and Alban also ran afoul of the authorities on their first trip to the resort and had to undergo the doubles process to get out of punishment. But, she tells him, she found the experience invigorating and inspiring, and she can tell that James does too. Where M serves only judgment and abuse, Gabby provides empathy and understanding. She invites him out to meet a group of friends who have all been through the process, and we even get more casual racism about the Lee Tolkien people. You don't understand Little Kia yet, but they are very generous with discipline, especially if they know you can pay. Mm. One of the people in the group, Dr. Modan, is even writing a book about the Little Kian doubling experience, which feels like it's going to be a bit noble savagey from the way that he's discussing them. You know, honestly, it's amazing that anyone is still alive in this country. He asked James the requisite sci-fi question you'd have to ask in a story like this. Do you worry they got the wrong man? And when James is asked if he feels like he witnessed his own demise, he jokingly, but tellingly, tells them, I can only hope. <laughs> it's James's self-loathing and need for belonging that pushes him into a silly breaking and entering scheme with Gabby's friends. Why? Because it's fun and there are no real consequences. Besides, he gets to be part of a group. The group is executed once again, but now they're fully enjoying public execution like it's a spectator sport. Emma is so disturbed by this that she finally leaves James behind. And with that, the real debauchery begins. Gabby offers James hallucinogens and they finally have sex, prompting a four minute abstract orgy scene. And it's all fun and games until the group tells James his passport is being held up by Thresh. So they kidnap Thresh and let James have his way with him as the group roots him on. Gabby reveals to James's horror that he hasn't been beating Thresh, he's been beating a double of himself. That's when it all sets in. James isn't beloved by the group. He's been their pathetic dancing monkey the whole time. And of course, Gabby rubs it in in the most emasculating way possible. Don't be pathetic tonight, James. It's so unattractive. It's here where James is broken. He sacrificed his wife and the safety and comfort of Western society for the ego trip that Gabby and the rest of the gang gave him, only to now discover that it was all a lie and that the inner voice telling him he was a loser was right all along. Hoping to get back what he once had, James hops a bus to the airport, only to have Gabby and company terrorize the bus until James agrees to get off. Yeah! Jamesy! This leads to a final act that is a David Lynchian psychogenic fugue involving the farm boy, M, and the tourist group, and a YouTube hostile head ripping scene. It is a cool practical effect if you're into that kind of thing. Finally, James is confronted by the group again, and Gabby tries to get him to kill a feral version of himself, only listed as the dog in the script. James refuses, but when his feral version attacks him, James goes postal and pummels his double's head until it's a fine paste. It's only at this point that Gabby offers him the comfort of her breast. Literally. And James, reduced to his infant state by failure and abuse that has been happening since before the film started, suckles at her teat. You're just gonna have to trust me on this third act. There's just not a whole lot I can show you. And just like that, everything returns to normal. The rainy season begins in Litolka, so Gabby, Alban, and the rest of the tourists prepare to return to their banal lives. Gabby's conversation about being so bored that she rearranges the living room when Alban is gone is just the kind of pumpkin spice Ugg boot Friday is Hawaiian shirt day humdrum that makes for a hilariously wicked joke after all we've just seen. Whenever I'm bored, I rearrange the house and it drives up and crazy. You don't. But that's the point. The debauchery, violence, and sadism are an escape for these people in their mundane upper-class lives. In the end, James realizes that, unlike his tourist counterparts, there is nothing left for him at home either. He was a hollow shell that wrote one critically derided book and wasn't able to follow up on even that. And here, he's also a hollow shell, wallowing in the rainy season. And that's Infinity Pool. Many viewers will see direct comparisons to HBO's The White Lotus, with its commentary on colonization and class structure. 
but the film just kind of leaves that hanging out there without dealing with it overtly. Most of the tourists make casually racist remarks about the savagery and corruption of the Lee Tolkien people, only to devolve into debauched inhuman criminals themselves. Which of course is different in their eyes because they're civilized people who are just enjoying themselves on vacation. They're not actually like that. And one can certainly do a Marxist reading of it, especially with the Cronenberg's tendency to portray alienation through technology and transhumanism. But the more interesting thing to me is Alexander Skarsgård's punch-drunk performance as James, and its perfect encapsulation of a man who sees himself as less than a man, and doesn't know what to do with that. I've seen many people online criticize Skarsgård's performance, or more accurately, Cronenberg's character, but it seems like the role draws comparisons to Stanley Kubrick's work, where a character is so devoid of humanity, they just walk around like an empty husk. James goes from meek and barely holding on by a single thread to pining for the days when he had a thread. Where do you think you're going, you little baby? Of course, the big draw is always going to be Mia Goth, who already won over the hearts of horror fans everywhere with her portrayal of Pearl and Maxine Minx in Ty West 2022 pairing Pearl and X. And here she uses something closer to her regular speaking voice, which sounds like a waifish Disney character. When I first read the script, uh, Gabby, my character, she even fooled me, right? So I thought I was being presented with one woman and she just kind of took me on this journey and just left me completely baffled and intrigued and just really very impressed with her. And that just lends to her initial charm. Is it coming out soon? She does seem immaturely enamored with James early on, and that's what makes her turn late in the film so much more frightening. Goth goes way over the top by the end, with the wild-eyed, cackling glee of a woman who knows that she will face no consequences for her actions. Come on, James! What are you doing in that, James? And she doesn't see James as a person. It's a performance of a character that is not so much evil as amoral. She's a character who revels in cruelty because the fun of being cruel is the point. Reducing James to a suckling infant has no lesson or moral for him to learn. There's no growth there. It's just fun for her. An act of social deviance for a woman who lives her life rearranging furniture because she's so bored. That's who James led into his life, and now he's a void. A husk waiting for the end of the rainy season. It's a bleak end to a film that asks a lot of its audience. But Cronenberg's themes are important ones for a world dealing with changes in what we expect men to be. Chuck Palahniuk knew this three decades ago, and it's a problem we continue to struggle with to this day. I hope you enjoyed your dip in the infinity pool. Stay warm, stay safe, make good choices, wash your hands, return your shopping carts, and I'll see you next time.